My name is Stephen Miller. I'm a professor of mathematics at Williams College. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the problems that I'm going to be mentoring for the Polymath Number Theory Summer 2022 program. So this will be my third year doing polymath projects, and I'm very excited to be potentially working with you. I want to talk a little bit about who I am, what my mentoring style is like, and a little bit about what the problems are. For the most part, however, I'm not going to go into very detailed descriptions of the problems. Instead, I'm going to share with you a link, which you can hopefully see right now, but if not, you can email me at sjm1 at williams.edu for more information about these problems. So again, the goal of this video is to just briefly introduce you to the general flavors, and then if you're interested, point you to some readings to get even more information. So I got my degree in mathematics from Princeton back in 2002. I was mentored by two wonderful professors, Peter Sarnak at Princeton and Henrik Gravanyets at Rutgers. So my main research area was on low-lying zeros of L functions, especially elliptic curves, but I've been interested in a variety of problems in number theory and probability and over the last few years in applied mathematics as well. So the problems I'm going to look at today, some of them are joint with former RU students of mine, some of them are joint with just colleagues from all over the world. So the first one I want to talk about is a project that's mostly done. It's on a non-commutative version of some problems in Ramsey theory. And so you could briefly describe this as trying to find sets that don't have a certain structure. So for instance, if you look at the integers, uh, what's the largest set you can have from one to n such that you have no three terms in a geometric progression? So you know, obviously if you have one, well, one can be in a geometric progression with anything. So if you have you know, one, two, four, one, three, nine, that'd be a problem. If you have two and four, you can't have eight. We wanted to know, well, what would happen if you looked at a non-commutative setting where now the way you multiply things could actually matter? And so again, we have a lot of nice partial results about this. There's a little bit more that needs to be done to finish this project. And then of course, there's a lot of related questions you can look at. And if you find you know, something like this interesting where we're dealing with what happens when you lose commutivity, and you're afraid, well, you know, I still have a lot of other things. We could go further and look at octonians. We no longer have even associativity. So again, the slides over here is just showing us a fair, fair introduction to you know, what we've been looking at. The link to the paper will give you far more details. The second uh, set of problems is from a former small student of mine who is now a graduate student at Illinois. And so again, I'm just giving you a very brief introduction. So what you can do is you can look at numbers and look at small devices and large devices. And again, whenever you use words like small and large, it's always important to decide, well, what do you mean by small and large relative to what? And so the question is, if I want to characterize numbers whose devices have certain properties, what can you say about such numbers? What kind of properties can you impose that you might find interesting, but also be mathematically tractable? And that, of course, is one of the greatest challenges is to balance between finding something that you're interested in and finding something where you actually have tools to make progress. So again, if you click on the link, you'll get far more details about this problem. The next is from a colleague of mine at Nagario University, Daniel Tse, and it concerns with generalizations of palindromic numbers. So if you take a number 198, you can factor that as two times three squared times 11. If you write it in reverse order, 891, that's three to the fourth times 11. So if you look at the sum of all the numbers you see, so on the right-hand side of 198, you have two, a three to the two and an 11. So you have four numbers, two, three, two, 11. That turns out to be the same as the sum of the numbers on the factorization of 891, three plus four plus 11. And so we would say that those numbers would have the same value. Of, you know, if we apply you know, function f whose effect on a number is to just sum all the numbers in sight. So you can then ask, well, what other numbers might have the same value under this function? What if I look at other functions? What if I look at other things other than palindromes? What if I change bases? So there's a whole variety of problems you can investigate. What I hope you're seeing from the proposed problems is that there's really a lot of different ways that you can go with these problems. You know, this is meant to be a springboard. Because we're going to have a lot of people working with many different levels of background and time availability, it's important to me to have projects that can go in a variety of different directions. Somebody might be interested in pursuing one thing, someone might want to pursue another thing. So you have an area where you are you know, essentially the point person, but you have other people doing similar things that you can intelligently converse with them. And then the last one is something that I've been intrigued on for years. So it turns out you can create a game based on Zeckendorf, I'm sorry, partitions, which is related to Fibonacci numbers. So any positive integer can be written uniquely 
as the sum of non-adjacent Fibonacci's if you define the Fibonacci's as one, two, three, five, and in general, each one is the sum of the previous two. If I want the decomposition to be unique, I don't want to start off with two ones or with a zero. And what you can do is you can play a game where you take some number and you start off, say I have the number 100, with 100 pieces on the one. And then on a given turn, if you have some kind of decomposition, if you have some numbers on the three peg and some numbers on the five peg, you could take a three and a five and remove them and put a number on the eight peg, because three plus five is eight, another Fibonacci. Or if you have two things on the eight peg, you could split that and get um, one thing on the three and one thing on the 13. So you can prove that as long as you don't start off with the number two, player two always has a winning strategy. It is a non-constructive proof. I would love to know what that winning strategy is, even if only in special cases. So there's a huge number of things that can be investigated in problems along these lines. Anyways, I hope this gives you a little bit of a sense of you know, who I am, what kind of problems I'm interested in looking at. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. My contact information again is sjm1 at williams.edu and the link to the slides and a little bit more descriptions of the problems is available here. Have a great day.